Hey, scholars, good to be back with you. And in this lesson, I want to talk about something non-numerical, something conceptual, and that's the idea of minimum principles. Now, I've said a couple of times that optimization is everywhere in the world around you, and that's true. Um, however, it's easy to think that it's only in the built-up world, the part of the world that people created. Uh, it is definitely there in lots and lots of places, but that's not the whole story. Optimization, or minimization, minimum principles, seems to be woven into the fabric of creation at a very deep, very profound level. And it's easy to miss that if you, if you don't know to look for it. What I want to do here is to tell you a little bit about it and give you some examples so you kind of have a sense for uh, how widespread this is. I don't want to say all, but at least very many physical laws can be derived using minimum principles. Now we won't go into the mathematics because it's often very complex. Uh, and outside the realm of what we're interested in this class, but definitely go find out more about it. There's lots of good books, there's stuff all over the web, really, really interesting stuff, and really gives you uh, the ability to look at the world around you through new eyes, and that's a wonderful thing, so definitely go do that. All I want to do now is give you some examples, and I'm going to start with one of the simplest ones here. I've got my toys here with me. This is just a piece of chain that I got at a Sears a long, long time ago, and I've been carrying it around all these years for pretty much what, what I'm about to do here. Now, the chains are heavy. This is, this is a real heavy piece of chain, and it has no bending stiffness, okay, at all. I can just wad it up, and I can stretch it back out. It doesn't matter. It's not like a piece of wire or a, a metal bar or something that does have bending stiffness. What it allows me to do, so I can get this here, allows me to do I can do this. Well, so what? Here's the thing. The shape of this, and it doesn't matter how close I put these ends, here or way out here, this shape is something called a catenary. It's a hyperbolic cosine, I think. And this is the perfect arch. Okay? My arms are getting tired, so I'm going to put this down and I'm going to tell you about it. Um, it's an arch. So here's what I, what I just drew. I'll take two points, and if you look in the books, these two points are always called A and B, because apparently mathematicians and engineers have no sense of creativity. And you get this, this curve that goes between them, and although I didn't quite get it here, it's, uh, it's symmetric about its center line, and this shape is called a catenary. Okay? Now, that chain has no bending stiffness. I can wad it up, it doesn't resist at all. So that means this, every part of this chain can be in tension only. It can't be in bending. So it's in tension only. Now the really cool part is if I could somehow freeze that, shoot it with glue or you know, liquid nitrogen or something, and freeze it and flip it over under the, you know, and so it's still only act, it only has gravity acting on it, then all the parts are in compression only, no bending. So this is the perfect arch. Uh, if you look at the St. Louis arch, it's a catenary. If you look at the Greek and Roman arches, really Roman arches, they're kind of trying to be a catenary. They don't know that yet because they didn't have the math at the time, but they're approximately catenary, some of them. If you go into more modern structures, there's one called uh, La Sagrada Familia in Spain somewhere, I don't remember where. There's brick catenaries all over the place in this thing. Okay? And so it's, it's interesting from, from a structural standpoint. But here's the thing, this shape, is the one that minimizes potential en or total energy, potential energy in the in the chain, okay, gravitational potential energy. Why is it this and not a circle, or why is it not a parabola, or why isn't it just a triangle? This one shape minimizes the potential energy of all these links. Okay, there is no other shape that has a lower potential energy than this one. Now you can derive this a couple of different ways. One is this, this hanging shape, just using uh, minimum potential energy. You can also use a force balance to come up with the same answer. And you, this is one of the uh, in, uh, founding problems in a field called the calculus of variations that I had to take a long time ago. And calculus of variations is very closely related to optimization. They're, they're really two facets of the same field. So there's one. Now go look, every time I walk, go past a McDonald's and I look at those arches, they look awfully catenary to me. They probably aren't. They're probably something else, but they're awfully close. So next time you go to McDonald's, 
see, it'd be really interesting to take a picture of the McDonald's arch and then try to fit a catenary to it and see how close you get. Probably pretty close. So this is things that are still. Okay? This is just sitting there. What about things that move? Now, it's hard to do things that move inside this little office, but I got this. This is a Nerf dart gun. I'm trying to hit the wall right next to the camera and not hit the camera. Okay, I stole this from one of my kids, and they're not getting it back. This thing is great. It's got this little sort of magazine thing in here. But these darts do something very specific. Okay? They, say they do something that all projectiles do. They follow a path that minimizes something called the action integral. Okay? And what we're looking at is something called the principle of least action. Okay? There's a whole field of uh, dynamics built around this, and again, it uses the calculus of variations. So, it gets, the, the principle of least action gets used all over in physics and engineering. It's absolutely everywhere. Anytime you see something called the Euler-Lagrange equations, you're looking at a manifestation of least action. Euler, now this is Leonhard Euler, the uh, German mathematician. I know it looks like Euler, and if you try to speak to, to uh, pronounce this as somebody would in English, it looks like Euler. He was German, EU sounds like Euler, so this is Euler. And this is Euler Lagrange, a um, French mathematician. Okay, so the Euler Lagrange equation, if you ever see that, that's nature minimizing something. Well, we're on a roll here, let's keep going. Um, there's also something called Fermat's principle. Now, this is not Fermat's last theorem. That's something different. This guy was pretty prolific. And the thing is, he wasn't even really a professional mathematician. I think he was a lawyer. Go check me on that. But I think that's what his job was. Um, back before there was such a thing as a full-time mathematician or full-time scientist, he had to have some other job or at least some other source of income. A lot of uh, landed gentlemen were, were doing this sort of thing. What I've got here is my little coffee pot, and it's, there we go, we'll get the kind of condensation off of it. This is just a hot pot I use in my office. I, I don't, I never learned to drink coffee, so I make tea in here. And, it, but it illustrates something really interesting. If I try to look through it, I don't see straight through it. You know, we've all seen this before. You see this light distorts as it's going through it. It's acting like a really bad lens, right? Why is that? Well, there's a couple ways to think about this. One is that the water has a different index of refraction than air does. The speed of light through air is essentially the speed of light through uh, vacuum. It's pretty close. But the speed of light through water is very much slower than the speed of light through air. And so the ratio of those two is called the index of refraction. And using geometric optics, I can figure out how light waves bend as they go through water. If you've ever looked at something on the bottom of a pond or a swimming pool or something, you know that where it appears to be isn't exactly where it is. And uh, that's, that's something we're all familiar with. That's the index of refraction at work here. Well, there's another way to look at it. When light moves from point A to point B, so when light goes from you know the reflected light off of me and I'm looking at through this at the camera out there, my eye is point A and the camera is point B, as it goes through a medium like that, it takes the path that gets it from A to B in the shortest time. That means that if I'm looking through a lens, the path the light rays take are the ones that minimize the amount of time to get from one point to the other. If I'm looking at a star a billion light years away, it also does that. And if you want to take that one step further, General relativity also uses minimum principles. It, it uh, imagines space-time as being warped by the presence of mass. And so when uh, a light takes a, a, travels from some distant object like a star or a galaxy to us, it's also taking an optimal path now through curved space. And so that's why we see light waves, or light rays, I guess, uh, bending as they go past the sun or they go past some massive object. Right? So there you have it, gang. This is just a couple of many, many different uh, instances where minimum principles are built into the fabric of the universe. 
This is heavy stuff. Very, very interesting. So it's not just in the built world around us. It's not just in the part of the world that humans created. It was there long before we got there. There you have it. Talk to you next time.